This week, Matt McGurk, the Solutions Architect with Source Defense, will discuss understanding web app client-side security with Source Defense. Lastly, in the security news for this week, analyzing chat logs with Python, consumer reports for IoT, hypothetically BSing, the year of the Linux desktop and the year of Linux malware are the same. Do you trust Google to tell you open source software is secure? Twitter finds WSL attack vector, Felina, UK government still won't pay a bounty, and ransomware that makes you a better person. All that and more on this episode of Paul's Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. Right now, everybody's talking about cryptocurrency, and the cyber criminals are hiding in the conversation. Cyber criminals use social engineering loaded with urgency and fear to successfully prey on your company, your employees, and your customers. Spear phishing is just one of 13 types of email threats. Barracuda has identified these 13 types and shows you how you can protect your company, your customers, and your reputation. Find out about 13, the 13 email threat types and Barracuda email protection. Get your free ebook at securityweekly.com forward slash Barracuda. That's securityweekly.com forward slash Barracuda. Welcome everyone to Paul's Security Weekly. It's episode number 743, recorded on June 1st, 2022, right here in G Unit Studios in Rhode Island. Uh, with me this evening on the lines remotely, Mr. Adrian Sanabria is here with us. Adrian, welcome. Hey, thanks, Paul. Deep into my uh, RSA training regimen right now. Nice. Not even joking. <laughs> Try, trying to get in like at least, uh, I've got 17,000 steps in today. Trying to get my body ready. You're like in, yeah, you're literally in your training for RSA, like training for walking. That's, it's impressive, man. Yep. Mr. Tyler Robinson is here with us. Tyler, welcome. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. And definitely not training. But. You are not training because you're, in, you're like injured again. Yeah. Always something, man. Always something. I've uh, been joking on social media that I'm currently unemployed. Which is like technically not not really true. I'm kind of in between uh, gigs right now, so uh, I have kind of stepped down from the Cyber Risk Alliance. I'll always do the show, so I'll be doing Paul Security Weekly and a new show um, that we're about eight or nine episodes in that we'll be releasing uh, hopefully soon, uh, which is exciting. So in a couple of weeks, I'll, I'll make sure I tell everyone uh, what's next for Mr. Paul. So you're just gonna have to wait. On with the show, though. A uh, quick announcement before we get started. If you've got a specific guest or topic you want us to cover on one of the shows, submit your suggestions for guests by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash guests. Complete that form. We review those on a weekly basis pretty much. So make sure you do that. Um, this segment is sponsored by Source Defense. You can visit securityweekly.com forward slash source defense to learn more. Also, you can stay tuned because we're going to dig into it uh, with Matt McGurk. Matt is an expert in JavaScript web technologies in both client-side at risk and client-side attacks and joins us to take an in-depth look at understanding web app client-side security and also how to use source defense. Matt, welcome to the show. Thank you, Paul. It's a pleasure to be here. It's nice to have you, Matt. How did, like, how did you get started in information security so people have a little bit about your background? Yeah, that's a great question. So I came up through web application development, um, but when I started doing it, the joke I tell is we didn't even really call them web applications yet. Um, and that just kind of grew naturally into security matters and things as I developed through my career and specifically the place that I find myself in today, which we're calling client-side security, or you know, if you're from a dev background, front-end uh, of the web application would be relevant too. But uh, you know, I basically spent my whole adult life looking at a web browser from a technical perspective, and this is what happens. So maybe that's a public service advisory for kids at home. Don't don't look at web browsers too much. And <laughs> hey Matt, just an FYI, your camera's frozen. Sometimes disabling it, re-enabling it uh, makes it unfreeze. That's that's just what I look like, though. Sorry. But, it wasn't like unflattering. It was still frozen. He's, he's yeah, throwing yeah. his voice. You're right. <laughs> uh, and there, he's back now. And Matt, I... 
I could tell just in the brief time we spent together, like you've got an amazing, uh, ex, you know, set of experiences with web browsers and such. Like you were using plugins. I was like, wait, what? What is that? What does that do? Like you've got a bag of tricks, man. That's pretty. It's pretty impressive. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we um, we as a, as a consequence of what we do, end up learning a lot about how web browsers work and how. Um, you know, you know, I don't think folks always consider this these web pages that they're interacting with as really full blown applications. So there's a bunch of tips and tricks you can go through uh, if you're a security minded or just kind of tinkerer sort of person uh, to mess mess around with web browsers. You know, what we were looking at is specifically stuff related to JavaScript. Um, I'm happy to go into any of that. I really want to delve into the topic too, but yeah. Um, it's a it's a pretty broad one, so maybe give me some direction on where you'd like to start. Yeah, and JavaScript's interesting. Like, I think the first most basic thing when we started seeing JavaScript heavy websites, we would just turn it off. And there was like pretty quickly after that a tipping point where like you can't turn JavaScript off in your browser. You just you just can't. Like nothing will work, right? Right. I was thinking about this today, and you know the the example that I, I use is, is kind of like, you have to think of your web application as being on the server, right? That's usually what we sort of think of. It's this thing that runs on somewhere in the organization and um, fulfills requests, right? But over the past 20 years, we've gotten to a place where the stuff that the server sends back to the web browser, to the client, is just as sophisticated in a lot of ways as a desktop application. So that's like the story I tell. And I was thinking about it today, like you can literally load Microsoft Word I think a lot of the Adobe products have mm -hmm. gone web-based inside of a web browser, which if you told me 25 years ago, you just load up the whole Microsoft suite natively inside of a browser, I thought we thought you were nuts. I think that a lot of that complexity um, is sort of bare, like you don't see it, you don't think of your banking application or even something like Twitter or whatever as being a really heavy uh, application, but it really is. It's mm -hmm. got an immense amount of code and it's... it's uh, it is also a new frontier for attackers, you I know, guess. That's interesting. Say, and, oh. Go ahead, Tyler. No, I was going to say, and that kind of leads to the direct problem, right? Like we put so much trust in the fact that there's a a web browser and the web browser is doing good security and they have a sandbox that is actually going to protect my end, uh, end computer from all of the crazy bad things that are being loaded, such as applications. You can't really verify all of that on, from the code underneath. Yeah, absolutely. And we often get, and as security practitioners, get stuck in this box of thinking about what do I need to do to make sure that my users at my company, that their endpoints don't get compromised because they do something, you know, ill-informed with their web browser, like download malware. But the problem that Source Defense works with, which is a new, newish, you know, the problem itself, like the root of it has existed for about 30 years or so, but it's only been actively exploited over the last five to 10 um, the, the problem that we're talking about is the risk that every company exposes their website's visitors to when they go to that company's website. So there's an inherent risk that people don't really understand and don't, uh, unfortunately, have the knowledge yet to take care of uh, just by providing a website to people publicly. And if, if anyone's familiar with the terms mage cart or form jacking or e-skimming, and then what, what Gartner and other folks are starting to call web application client-side security, which is kind of a mouthful, but it is a good way to define it. That's, that's the term that we've coalesced around to, to call this thing out as separate from, I need to virtualize the browser so that nobody clicks on something they're not supposed to. This is a whole different thing. Yeah, I mean, it's essentially you're you're loading all kinds of code from different parts of the application and then other third parties. I mean, it's similar to, you know, libraries you're including in your Python code, except this is on the user side when they load a site. Your components are loading from all over the place, correct? Precisely, yeah. So to put it, uh, you know, a somewhat high level, the idea here is you have, I'm going to speak from the position of someone, you know, publishing a website. You've got a web application that sends out a bunch of content when someone hits the website. That content is HTML and CSS and JavaScript. You've written some JavaScript yourself to make, you know, if you're a shoe company, the thing that lets you put the cool shoes together. Um, so that code is stuff you wrote in-house and it needs to run and it needs to be secured. But the bigger, scarier thing to tackle first is you're also going to have a whole bunch of integrations of third-party code that gets loaded on the fly. So sometimes when we talk about software supply chain and security matters related to that, 
We're talking about node package manager or libraries, that mm -hmm. kind of dependency. Mm -hmm. In this case, we're talking about literal vendor code, software written by a vendor that the web page is instructing the browser to download and execute in real time. And that code is coming from somewhere else on the internet that doesn't belong to that shoe company, uh, that the shoe company can't exert any security control over. So you basically, you're telling your visitors web browsers, hey, go execute a bunch of stuff from different places and we trust it, you know. Uh, oh, we lost you for a second there, Matt. It sounded like your microphone got disconnected or unplugged. Maybe the batteries died. That's what it sounded like, right? Like there was a, a distinct, yeah, was yeah. Like, there was a click. It, it was not like a internet bandwidth, like go robot issue and then drop out. It yeah. was just like a sudden, like uh, a We're front end loader. Zoom. Like that. Zoom yeah, it's like fun like yeah. the dentist. It's required. You have to do it. Right. You know, you know, your regular checkups is just never a great experience. <laughs> do you guys know what he's got going on behind him? Because his background is moving. Yeah, he said something about spending a lot of time on his background in the pandemic. <laughs> like it, they just look like picture frames, but they're all moving. There's like these That's 3D really cool. like no Adrian, Adrian you're seeing stuff buddy I did not see any movie yeah. picture for <laughs> I wasn't even the one that mentioned it Dimitri mentioned it in the Discord mm. and I hadn't even noticed and then once he pointed it out I couldn't, couldn't stop yeah. looking couldn't at not it. see it right oh great mm -hmm. now I'm gonna see it I mean it was just getting on a roll too though there's some very interesting things I'm I'm curious about yeah like the I, I was just about ads to say, and and how JavaScript yes. with with ads plays into in into Google that Analytics because I think a lot of people yes. think like they don't have this problem or haven't done this stuff like oh that's only if you have a shopping cart or if you're a big application but if you spin up a website today and you throw Google Analytics on it you essentially have this problem. Yeah, and, and just about everybody's using some form of metrics or analytics. Even if you're using a hosting provider and like a default spun up site, most of those include scripts and JavaScript with inside of it for, you know, basic tracking. That doesn't even include any of the ad tracking network stuff that you have to get into. So uh, it is kind of scary when you think about what the browser is protecting, how many people are using different versions of browsers between OSs and, and on different devices. And some of those may be compatible for patching, maybe not, maybe have the ability to do protections as a uh, an enterprise or maybe not. Mm -hmm. It becomes very interesting how you actually go about protecting those pieces. Yeah, I, I can hear you guys hear me. Yes, he's yep. back. Actually, can hear yeah, so Matt, I'm, uh, it's good to have you back. I was just uh, saying, I think a lot of people think they don't have this problem or wouldn't have this problem, but something as simple as Google Analytics is exactly the scenario you're describing, correct? Right, exactly. Where basically every website, if it's customer facing, is going to have some kind of third party integration. Um, it's on average, we just published an industry report, uh, which people can check out on our website, but it's something like five to 10 on the average website, it varies by industry. And even if you're aware of this, you, you, almost nobody has a control in place for this. Because um, I caught a little bit of what Tyler was saying about the difficulty of just managing the browser as an application itself. But there really aren't or haven't been until the last couple of years any ways to control the behavior of the web page as it's executing out in browsers somewhere. We're, we're still kind of um, burdened by this idea that a web page is like a page in a magazine like it's yeah. images and text and who cares about what happens there security wise but, but that's, that's there a great point man because we the way the browser is in websites are designed without source defense right is i got a, ta a tab that tab is isolated within the browser the website mm -hmm. that loads inside that tab is protected by the same origin policy but all the code that executes in the context of that url or that domain name i should say right um, it, it executes in the same context. In other words, they can interact with each other and there's no separation, right, between anything that's loading within that tab from that from that website. Yeah, you, you got it on the head. And anything that that page chooses to load itself has mm -hmm. the same permission. So to be very, well, we're on the technical segment. I guess I'll be technical. Sure. Uh, specifically, what we're talking about is what's called the document object model, which right. is the programmatic right. representation of a web page. And there are what are called web APIs. Now, these are not external APIs out to the world. They're just things the web browser 
tools the web browser lets JavaScript use mm -hmm. to manipulate that, that DOM. And there are no security controls around that at all. Um, anyone who's executing in the browser, meaning the code came from shoecompany.com, it came from Google Analytics, it came from some other vendor, can manipulate the DOM however mm -hmm. they want to. And the issue is that the DOM is all the content on the web page and all the user data right. in forms right. and et cetera as it's entered. So you've got, that's like, yeah, people think they've got this one solved because of a laugh or something like that, but um, there just isn't any native control for it actually. Mm. That's really interesting. I wonder why they didn't build any controls into it. Well, I, yeah. I think the difficulty is it, it would have to be in the runtime, right? So if you built anything for it, it'd have to be compatible with all. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, it sounds similar. tricky, right? Right. Yeah. So all the applications are different. As they coexist with whatever application you've written, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. You've got a couple of weird interactions there. One is this legacy, like I've talked about a couple of times, of front end web dev being the wild west where it's like we're just going to throw some stuff in the web page and make it do cool stuff and kind of driven by marketing technologies and other things just the adoption rate of front end javascript is nuts there's some folks who publish something called um the javascript uh the state of javascript every year and you can see these adoption trends where it's like six to nine months from being brand new to being deprecated um, but point being is that it was the Wild West when JavaScript was imp implemented. Famously, the guy who put it together was tasked to do it in about 10 days to compete with uh, Microsoft Microsoft's ActionScript technology. Mm -hmm. So he had to come up with a language spec in two working weeks. And, you know, I mean, I'm not trying to knock the guy, but security wasn't something he thought about because right. you know, it wasn't something that needed to be secured. And now we're ending up at this point where we really do need it. But I think JavaScript and, security wise was better than action scripts, <laughs> active scripts rather. Right? Active uh, scripts were a train wreck. Uh, they were like a train wreck, weren't they? Well, yeah, active active server pages, the server based yeah. technology been pretty bad. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Nobody's really written anything serious in action scripts in about 15 you also, years. You also have the. You also have the uh, the caveat of of advertisement too, because you don't always control uh, as as a company. You don't control which company is advertising on your page. You may have a vertical or an advertising right. company or stream which is coming in. And each one of those advertisements has their own JavaScript that has the ability mm -hmm. to run. There's uh, vectors there that don't even touch, you know, web sockets or protocols that are running in the browser, which is an entirely different problem that, uh, from a security standpoint, just seems horrible. It's an excellent yeah, you, point, and it illustrates two things. One is that we talk about third parties, but JavaScript can call JavaScript. So you get right. the ad being a fourth party, and then the ad calling an analytics tool because it wants to know how well it's doing. Uh, so you get this supply chain that I've seen go like 11 or 13 hops deep. Um, so lots of code. <laughs> the second thing is the advertising deal is a cool example because there, there's, there was an attack, uh, I want to say early 2010s, um, against the German parliament, where the attacker didn't really attack anything. They bought advertisements on an advertising network and said, give me the eyeballs of whoever is in this IP range, which happened to belong to the German parliament, and then served malware through the browser that fashion. So there wasn't really any exploit. Nobody mm. broke into anything, but uh, they did do some damage. So yeah, the creative options for attackers are kind of limitless once you get into the browser. And browser, I mean, I just want to go through some of the other, like, defenses from a user standpoint for a moment. Like, browser plugins help a little bit, but not, because they still have to figure out what's an ad or what could be malicious or not, essentially. Well, yeah, and to your point earlier, if you try to browse the internet with, you know, no script running or something, a plugin that disables all your all JavaScript, you don't really see the web uh, the, yeah. the normal web anymore. You kind of see, usually you see a page that says, hey, you got to turn on JavaScript. The second thing about that is, yeah, that would, if I'm a security conscious end user, I can do that. But the responsibility is still on the companies who are, you know, shipping code into my browser mm -hmm. um, to make sure that I'm I'm protected from that stuff that is being managed well, I suppose. So yeah, it's, it's an interesting problem where it exists in the end user space, but it is the responsibility of the the origin, I guess. Yeah. And usually those are essentially like a blacklist. Like this is what typically constitutes an ad, maybe by domain name or file name or whatever. So block that. And that's the level of sophistication in Adblock Pro and a lot of those other plugins, right? Yeah. They're not, um, they're not security tools. I mean, they're privacy tools or they're, um, uh, 
you know, quality of life sorts of things for your web browser to solve the security problem. You do need some way to control the code in the browser. Just like if you cared about the security of your web app on the server side, you're going to have controls in place to manage the development life cycle of it, the, how it's doing at runtime and all this other stuff. You kind of, you need that, in my opinion, for the front end as well. Matt, what what do typical attacks look like? I mean, we kind of talked about the what we used to call drive by drive by down. Not so much drive by down. Was it drive by downloads? Right, where I go to a website, it has an ad thing, and the ad serves me uh, some kind of malware. Um, what are some other common of common attack vectors? Right, because an attacker has to control somewhere in the supply chain the code that gets loaded through an application into someone's browser. Right. So you've basically got two flavors of this: first party and third party. So the, the term mage cart, which is, was the originating kind of the landmark fire of client-side security, that comes from the terms Magento, which is an e-commerce platform and shopping cart. Um, so the shopping cart part of Magento was weak to a certain kind of uh, vulnerability. And these 12 attack groups, mage cart groups, one through 12, um, all started kind of exploiting that vulnerability to put malicious code inside of the web browser. So in that case, it was about a flaw inside of Magento that the attacker then used to put a file on those companies' own servers mm. that then went out to their customers. That's what I would call a first-party attack, mm -hmm. meaning that there's a vulnerability in the organization's own web app that lets an attacker put code in the browser eventually. The second one was what I was describing before, which is a supply chain or a third-party, fourth-party kind of attack, where one of the vendors that the browser is instructed to grab code from as it's rendering the web page, one of those vendors is compromised. And so when we talk about attack vector, it's really any web application vulnerability, misconfiguration, infrastructure kind of deal across the entire code base of the web application, including that code base as extended to all that vendor code. Um, if you talk about historical examples, I can get to that, give some yeah. citations, but that's the general idea. I am <clears throat> ahead, I'm Tom. curious if, if there have been any new new attack vectors around kind of stealing that information out of the DOM, right? So there is, you know, some secure coding, there's some decent built apps, there's information that ends up in the browser from a page where if you're able to look at the DOM or you're able to run code that is within inside of uh, the DOM or, or the browser in that context, are, have you seen any attacks where they're stealing things like, you know, one-time backup codes or... Uh, 2FA pushes or different passwords that are getting input or or information getting output into the browser. That I thought we would see a lot more of that by now, and I have not seen a ton of that from most of the, the crime work kits I've seen. Sure, yeah. So the idea there is if I'm in the DOM, then, you know, what can I do about two-factor or something else that's... Um, that I might want to involve in my overall attack. And if I can manipulate the DOM, I could get really tricky. I know I don't have, I don't have citations of this stuff, but mainly because I think it's underreported. Um, something else we haven't talked about is how hard this is to detect or mm -hmm. even kind of research in, in a pen or sort of an incident response kind of sense. But nonetheless, you could do something very tricky in like setting up your own call center and then manipulating the DOM to say, hey, call here to help us walk you through the, the MFA process. That's, that's not... Um, that's common in other kinds of attacks and certainly facilitated by being able to mess with the web page and show the visitor whatever you want. I mean, a more common kind of attack that would get around two factor would just be, let me just put on the attacker. I'm just going to put a form in this web page that says type in your stuff or your credit card number or your bank account numbers before I send you to log in and just say, thanks for that information. Here's the login page. And then I've got your stuff without having need to actually need to get around any kind of more advanced authentication system. So it's social engineering plus the unlimited ability to look like the website that you've compromised. So then we come to <clears throat> really the, the some of the solutions to this problem, which I, I would have, I don't know if people hadn't thought about it or it just kind of exacerbated over time. How do I put controls within the DOM to separate all of the different pieces of code that are running? I mean, that's essentially the crux of the solution that you're implementing at Source Defense, right? Yeah, that's true. And over the past, you know, as this as this space has matured, you know, call it before 2010, um, there are people who've tried to solve this problem. You saw things that are now deprecated, like Google's Kaha project and, and a few others. 
that were about sort of like we were Tyler, you kind of meant touched on this before about um, manipulating the the environment with, that the runtime's running in, kind of proxying JavaScript, meaning changing bits of how the language works in the browser to make it harder to do bad things. But you get into this kind of game of whack-a-mole. And we were talking about this before we went live today of like, if you're all in the same runtime, how can you, you know, say, no, you can't take 16 digit numbers because some other code could just clobber you, right? Sort of. Um, so that was what happened for a long time. Um, and you also see things that are built into the HTTP spec. So the actual yep. World Wide Web Consortium has defined some controls called content security policy and sub resource integrity, which are I usually say are like well meaning technologies. They are they are good if you are doing something like taking your intranet web app that does HR stuff and breaking it across different servers, and you all own all of those. Uh, you're going to be in okay shape with CSP for that. But as soon as you start doing an actual full fledged thing out on the internet, um, CSP and SRI become less attractive. What we've chosen to do at Source Defense is, is pursue our own tech, which relies on isolation. So basically putting all the outside vendor code into a sandbox, kind of nestled just inside the web page, and then doing uh, like a rules based behavioral filtering on the fly. So watching that sandbox, seeing scripts try to read or write stuff to be really reductive, um, and then deciding whether that behavior is good or bad, and then allowing it or not. So you get a nuanced kind of behavioral control over those things I was talking about before, the, the web APIs inside the browser, rather than just saying, everybody can have whatever access they want, or like with CSP, I'm going to trust this URL here, even though I don't know what it's going to do once the right. browser loads it. And so now, if it does, go ahead, Tyler. If it if it does do bad things, that sandbox protection does does that alert you? Does that log? Does that uh, block the interaction or the data? Does the communication and the pass through between those different APIs still happen just in a proxied and protected manner, or do you have to know about the threat in order to proxy that and and stop it? Yeah, that's a great question. So what we've decided is kind of a positive um, rule definition, if that makes sense. So we are about saying that we were talking about analytics before. Let's say that our analytics tool needs to read one part of the web page, and then it can know that the page view happened, and it can turn that into metrics and a dashboard somewhere, so on and so forth. So the way we would approach the problem is to say, yes, this tool may read this one image, but it can't do anything else. So almost like a very old school firewall rule, like deny everything and then allow these specifics. That's kind of the idea of, a, of that, uh, that rule definition, definition I was talking about. And then moving forward, even if that code changes on another server to become malicious, or it just changes because they released a new version of it, that rule that we defined up front, because it's both straightforward and it's about the things we want to happen, um, will continue to persist. So what I say sometimes is you could theoretically run us against known compromised code. And so long as the attacker didn't rip out the, the stuff that it's supposed to do. Um, it will keep, keep doing those beneficial things and not uh, allow any of the malicious things to happen, which sounds like a bold claim. But like I said at the top, there just aren't any security controls. So as soon as you start to implement them, you get some cool results. And Matt, do you have JavaScript that's executing within the DOM that's applying the controls to other JavaScript executing in the DOM? Yes, that's a great question. And I got to see where you're going. So what we do is take advantage of uh, a couple of things. And again, here's the technical segment. So um, sequential load order, meaning that, you know, an HTML document, the thing that the web app sends back to the browser is a text document until the browser starts to kind of chew on it. Right, and render it right, into a web right. Page. <clears throat> so what we do, we're the first thing to load, meaning that we're the first script that actually does something interactive. And the second thing we leverage is what's called single threaded execution, meaning that the browser doesn't execute anything in parallel. It just executes the first thing first. So by being set up first, we can then run and create those sandboxes I was talking about mm -hmm. and also force the browser to defer any of that other code into those isolated environments. So you get around that problem. That was kind of where I started talking was um, how do you not play whack-a-mole if you're all in the same runtime environment? Well, you start first and you put other stuff in a different runtime environment. And that's just a matter of where you put the code, right? It, it executes from top to bottom. In, yeah, in the that is uh, right? one of the design decisions made, yeah. <laughs> made in the JavaScript runtime. Whatever's first goes first. 
And and I think that answers uh, earlier question that I had off air, which was, uh, you know, couldn't malicious uh, scripts just do to you what you did to them? And uh, the answer would be no, because you're you're first. Mm-hmm. Right. Precisely. Yeah. So it's it's much like any other integration into a web page, except we're a security product. So uh, we do certain things to make sure it's secure. But yeah, it's, it's just a nice benefit of, of being in the browser for all the other weird quirkiness about it. It does let you set up a decent security solution. Good That's, to be the king. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> your reference. I don't know how many people are going to get Mel Brooks references. <laughs> Um, Probably fewer and fewer every day, unfortunately. But from <clears throat> from just browser security in general, and and some of the ways in which you're protecting the DOM, does that have any negative impact on the user or say security products that are scanning URLs prior to loading in the browser or uh, stripping stuff at the edge, SSL stripping on you know your layer seven firewalls or things like. Uh, uh, URL scan.io where they're actually grabbing and scanning URLs and, and the DOM. Uh, if you're the provider of that website, uh, that obviously can affect you know what what's getting loaded from the end user standpoint or what you're providing your customers. Is there any worry about the performance or things that aren't being provided to the customer or analytics that aren't getting served up properly? Yeah, it's an interesting point. So the answer is no, we don't. Um we don't interfere with the user experience is what I would call it at all, either from you got a couple of users there, right? And so either the person clicking on stuff on the web page, they're going to see it just exactly as they would. And then the second user kind of in that question would have been, let's call them the business user, someone who consumes analytics that that website is spitting out. Um, so in the second case, no, we've been designed to let the software, the third-party integrations run just like they would anyway. That's that kind of positive definition model I used. And the second thing is by not playing that game of whack-a-mole, that kind of traffic cop in the middle of the freeway sort of thing, um, we let the code just run how it normally would. So from the perspective of the third-party integrations, it's just like they're running right on the web page. In terms of like actual experience of clicking on stuff on the website, you know, you got to think about the document object model as a bunch of like nodes in a tree. It's not a Um, it's not the full rendered, interactive, image-filled, video-filled page. It's just a bunch of abstracted text sitting in memory somewhere. So shuffling that back and forth is really cheap in terms of, I guess, computational resources and memory and stuff. The kind of reflection we do is less than a millisecond to get back and forth uh, with the evaluation. So it's a decent way to do it, I think. And yeah, it doesn't affect the, the, the experience of going to a website or a web page. Matt, if there's a, a shopping cart or payment element on a website that they've using a third-party JavaScript for, and let's say I've compromised that third-party JavaScript, I've put code in there that sends me everyone's credit card numbers in addition to sends them off to be processed or you know, some kind of tampering attack like that. How, how do you guys find that, right? How do you know that, I've, that an attacker has somehow compromised the JavaScript that's being loaded on the page? Sure. So it's about observing those behaviors. So if you're hanging out on the page like we are, um, you're seeing, you know, those would be basically what's called, it's like a read, it's like a get. So Mm -hmm. something is trying to get an element on the page that it's not supposed to. Our approach simply never presents that data to be gotten, I guess, to put it a certain way. Um, From the environment, that sandbox that the code, the malicious code you're describing would be running in, those form fields kind of exist, but they're always empty. So as the user is typing something into their, their, you know, as their keyboard into the credit card number field, um, the web page is seeing it. The web app that needs to process that will see it once the button's clicked. But the sandbox version of the page that the third parties are interacting with won't ever have that data. Um, and you know, it kind of is an interesting segue right there between the security thing and the the compliance or like the privacy implications of this. Because without some kind of solution to this problem, every web page is just kind of leaking out all that data to the third parties. So I'm not claiming that every single third and fourth and fifth party is consuming all that data, like that they're pulling it to a server somewhere, but they're certainly capable of it. And there's now laws and there's industry regulations. PCI just rolled out their new stuff to say you specifically have to control for this. But just the data hygiene aspect of it, I guess, is is, uh, interesting and a little scary to think about. But that the, my credit card number still has to go to the legitimate place, correct? How does right? Yeah, how does that work? That was my question. Yeah. Is is 
is there app specific configuration you have to do to determine like like who gets this and who doesn't some kind of I see your question per- yeah so the uh, no there's not app specific control required and the credit card still has to get submitted is the second part of it so the the code you're talking about there would be what I would call first party code which we would not sandbox so the sandbox stuff is the vendor code that's all black box the way we handle the first party part of the equation is to put controls around the indi- individual form fields and say something like this library that's part of the front end app needs to see business critical information another one doesn't so to sum it up quickly um the first party code is handled a little bit separately from the uh, third party stuff that you really need to keep in kind of a highly quarantined sort of environment oh so the sending of the credit card number is actually done on the server side not in on the client side uh it depends Mm -hmm. on on how the web app is written but in the event that you need to, I can't think of a legitimate reason one would need to like manipulate a credit card number and send it to a bunch of people in the front end of the browser. There's, I there's better ways to do that. Yep. I got you. Yeah. It should be a post, right? Yeah. And that's getting past, well, I mean, you can do post requests via JavaScript, of course, but if you're just talking about the literal form submission, that's handled directly in the HTTP transaction back to the server. So yeah, I mean, there's a lot of ways to just peel that particular apple, I guess. Well, that's very so, interesting. This is, this yeah, is almost like uh, like AMP, AMPC for uh, for a browser or the old uh, oh, the Emmet, the old Emmet security model that the Microsoft started deploying and built into into AMPC eventually. It's it's very interesting that sandbox and, and segmentation of even memory space uh, becomes much more difficult to do things from an attacker standpoint, I guess. Yeah, because I could imagine you're also protecting the credentials as well and the auth tokens. Does it help in those scenarios as well? Like if there's a cross-site scripting and I'm trying to steal authentication tokens? Sure. Um, You know, it gets a little muddy to get, you know, I need to kind of see the specific example you would be thinking of. But any data that's transacted by the browser, whether it's kind of in user land, like in a form input or something else, or a token that's stored in a cookie or in some other, uh, you know, a storage mechanism available to the browser, all that I would throw into the bucket of user data, which again, we take the approach of sandboxing. So keeping it away from the sources that shouldn't have it and then access control on the kind of front end, sorry, the first party side of the front end, meaning that what code should and shouldn't touch these different pieces of user data. And like I said, without some way to control it, you're kind of in the wild west where it's accessible to anybody. Matt, did you have an example you wanted to show us? Sure, absolutely. Um, So what I can do here, I'll show you just guys just a couple tools that you might want to consider using. I want to talk about some easy ways to understand what the risk looks like on a given website. So let me share my screen here. So you were looking at, and let me know if we're not, at the New York Times. And I'm not picking on them for any particular reason other than that they're a website. Um, one of the things that I have loaded into my web browser, Paul, you were mentioning some of the tools and stuff I've gotten here, uh, is just a tool called Ghostry. Some of you may be familiar with it. It's not really a security tool. It's more of a privacy tool. Um, but these, it's also useful in my work because these things that Ghostry is calling a tracker, these 18 other things, are JavaScript mostly. Uh, that the browser is loaded from somewhere else on the internet. So basically these are things that the New York Times has decided would help them run their website as a business. And now they're running on my computer, but they almost certainly came from other sources on the internet. So the other, you know, the next step down, if I want to be a little more technical about it, is doing this kind of research through the dev tools in a browser. So for anyone who's not familiar, every browser has these developer tools in them. And they also give an idea of what, you know, you can get a very close idea of what JavaScript is being loaded and what it's doing. And so what I've done here is just pull up the network console and wait for any JavaScript to load into here. Um, And I can analyze what has been loaded into here and what it's supposed to do. Oh, I see, I'm looking at WebAssembly, which nobody uses. Here's the JavaScript. Um, And so basically what I'm illustrating here is the amount of stuff that just got loaded and executed by my browser. I think if I look down here, it's, it's like about, two and a half megs of text that's all executing now from different parts of the internet. So my job now as a, let's say I'm analyzing the risk of all this. 
is to figure out where all this code came from, what it's doing and why it's here. And so I have that, um, that problem that we were talking about before, how, how do I know this is happening? Because, and I, I hinted at this before, but let's imagine that I'm doing incident response for the New York Times. They had some kind of front end breach, I'm imagining, um, where credit card numbers were stolen off of their subscription pages. So my job now is to kind of stare at this thing and try to find all the events that fired from all the other different pieces of JavaScript across the entire front end, and then uh, identify the root cause of that breach. And that work is is very, very difficult, not just because of the quantity of stuff that we see in here, but also because of the um, the shifting nature of this thing. So I think if you guys are keeping an eye peeled, you might have seen this list of trackers kind of increase as I was hanging out on this page, I'm trying to find a less bummer headline to click on here to illustrate the next thing. Um, but that will shift this list and these third parties will shift based on my behavior um, on the page as a visitor, where I am geographically in the world because they'll market to me differently or, or do different kinds of uh, functionality, basically, um, or how far I get down, let's call it a sales funnel. So basically, if the closer you get to buying a product, the more interested a marketing team will be in your behavior. So you'll see more of this code show up. So then from a security kind of perspective, um, it becomes incredibly tricky to get an accurate sample, if you want, or a definitive investigation into everything that happened on the client, because it's just so much code and it shifts all the time. And as we've spoken about pretty extensively, uh, there's no controls over any of this by default. It's just everybody gets to play. Um, so those are a couple of tools that I use to go through sort of um, just illustrating the risk. And this would also be the sort of thing that you might do to uh, start on your own internal, you know, if, if you're looking to learn more about this, start on your own, you know, journey down client side security is, is something like this work. That's a lot of code to look, and it's not always formatted correctly either. Yeah, it's always minified. It's always uh, uh, uglified, as we say in JavaScript land. But that's also kind of interesting. All JavaScript is plain text. So there's, you can just read it and find out whatever you want, which um, leads to some other interesting consequences for security. Yeah, sometimes the comments that, that also are super means, interesting too. Yeah, that also means you have to understand it. And like having looked through a lot of this Java code, looking mm -hmm. for places to hide... I feel like it's a, a COBOL developer. It's No one understands it, reads it. Yeah, right. uh, I don't know where they get these programmers that build all this massive stuff that comes together and somehow works, because I haven't met anybody that claims to know how to program in JavaScript very well. <laughs> well, yeah, and, well, in a, but I think it's they grab a module from here, a sample from there. Like They're grabbing a lot of other people's code and kind of which, blending it in. Which becomes a whole other big issue, right? Like if we mm -hmm. talk about libraries and supply chain uh, problems for code and the, the bill of materials for, for libraries and code, you talk about JavaScripts and modules and where these all are coming from. And even the companies that are providing the ad tracker libraries for those modules to be loaded into pages – how do we know that that code is secure? How do we secure that code? How do we validate the integrity that we're loading up and serving to our clients? Maybe we have very high-end clients or, or clients that need to be very security conscious. How do we protect them? Like That's a problem that I don't even think we've touched the surface on. Yeah, and we've seen these kind of attacks occur in basically every industry, every you know, every size of business. So you get these really wacky, like public br breach disclosures, like in a single attack, because it would be based on a common third party vendor, a uh, major league sports team, heavy manufacturing firm and sole proprietor law firm are all involved in the exact same breach. And then we've seen, let's see, Macy's, uh, British Airways, Ticketmaster, Newegg, Hannah Anderson, a bunch of others that um, have gotten breached along the years and they all have kind of, I don't mean to sound callous, but interesting features to those different attacks where the code persisted on the website for four years, or it was the world's largest GDPR fine, or um, it, it's established the uh, precedent that website owners are responsible for this code legally. So there have been these series of kind of landmark events over the past five years or so um, and they're all tied together, but sometimes I think, you know, I, I don't follow other security disciplines as, fall, as closely as I follow my own. I know sometimes you just see the headlines, you're like, oh, there's another thing that happened. But there is this through line through a lot of the largest stuff 
recently, um, which is all this client side aspect of it because it is so hard to control. Yeah, you mentioned Newegg, like not to pick on them in any uh, way, shape, form, or fashion, but the amount of code they're loading, probably similar to New York Times, right? And tracking and the functionality oh, yeah, they I have mean, is, is very vast. Think about the example, you know, the analogy I was drawn before about Microsoft 365 being in the browser right now. I would say that that Newegg mm -hmm. or any contemporary uh, e-commerce website, that web page is probably as sophisticated as Microsoft Word. It yeah. just happens to let you buy graphics cards, not right. uh, do desktop publishing. But yeah, these are incredibly sophisticated systems and applications that you know, we all kind of like and enjoy. And well, don't want but to there's a great, a great attack vector too, as um, difficult as it is to buy a graphics card. I think it was on Best Buy. Uh, again, not to pick on Best Buy, but I had to wait in like a virtual line. And obviously that's, I mean, that's all being implemented in, in JavaScript, some combination of client and, and server side code to put people in queues and things like that. Absolutely. And I think that's a great example of um, what I was talking about before of like the, urgency and the speed with which front-end JavaScript development kind of happens. I remember earlier in the pandemic, I was speaking to, to folks and they were saying, well, I was going to do this project, but we had to drop everything and make up curbside pickup. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. And we built all, all this functionality into the website. And the front end just moves so much faster than everything else. Mm -hmm. Databases for as, as quickly as we've gone from SQL to no SQL to whatever we're doing now, I don't pay attention anymore. Like I said, the front end, basically someone on the business side in a profit center says, we need to do this. And then the devs do it. And then security finds out a year later yeah. or so. Yep. Um, so still love you. Um, Matt, how, yeah. how easy is this to implement on a website? I mean, we've talked about some of the most, most complex websites that are out there today, but for like your average web application, how easy is this to to implement? Like, give us a uh, and, and follow up follow up question. What's the potential performance impact, if any? Mm. Right. So I kind of touched on the. I'll do them backwards. Uh, I touched on the performance thing a little bit, which is it, it doesn't realistically. Um, our code has to execute in the browser like all the other code, but in the grand you know life cycle of a web page as it's living and breathing, we don't really put our thumb on the scales at all. Um, implementation is pretty dead simple too. It's two lines of HTML that go in the web application. Uh, cause I kind of hinted at before, cause the thing, because what we're configuring are rules about other people's software, these vendors and such, um, we have, we know those rules, right? We're deployed on, uh, billions of page views per something these days. I think that's a half year stat or something. But the point is that we're, we're saying that this advertising service can put an ad on the page or this chat service needs to run on this part of the page, not, not here's how every specific web application in the world works. And so that lets us be really easy to deploy. Like I said, we've done it in as little as 48 hours and, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's good. People like it. That's awesome. <clears throat> yeah, because you, you, so what you're saying is you have, uh, because of your, where you've been deployed, you have experience in like if you've got an ad <clears throat> JavaScript component, you kind of know what the rules are for that already. Right. It's it's because the tool that we're managing is going to be the same tool no matter where we find it. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, if you need a, uh, you know, if you need a safety trigger for your nail gun so nobody accidentally nails their hand to the wall, that safety trigger is going to be the same on all the nail guns, even if it's in a bunch of different garages along the way. I didn't know if that analogy was going to land. I'm glad no, that, that I made yeah, it. Yeah, that's yeah. that's fair. That's I'm kind of critical of analogies, and I think that one works. It's not. Per, I mean, I didn't. It's, you know, not part, that's yeah. new. it's new for your audience. I just I just came up with that one. I don't think any analogy is is totally perfect, right? But it should serve to have an example that is relevant. Without if being it were totally perfect, perfect, would it be an analogy? Exactly. Yeah. This? Agreed. Agreed. Right. Yeah. And I know Tyler touched on this before, but like, what am I getting in terms of like alerts? And then like, what's my response to that, Matt, in, in your experience? Yeah, so our, so there's a lot of, so CSP and SRI, I'll just mention quickly, they're not our technology, but mm -hmm. they were some of the first like uh, attempts at providing any security reporting out of the browser. So before CSP, SRI, there was no way to get information back to the hosting organization about what was going on in the web browser security wise. Our own approach is to prevent rather than detect and remediate. So we enforce those rules, like I was saying, upfront and control the code. We do log and report and have dashboards and all that. But the goal is to 
prevent the behavior before it can harm anybody rather than giving an analyst or somebody else, you know, an alert saying, hey, go look at this piece of JavaScript, find out what it's doing and whether you want that to happen or not. So our approach is not about, it's not reactive, it's, it's proactive and preventative. Um, in general, if you want kind of security telemetry out of the browser, and aside from a solution like ours, yeah, you're, you're, you're kind of doing that sort of uh, analysis I showed before, uh, basically looking at the runtime on the fly and figuring out what's going on or using a pretty blunt instrument like content security policy and the reporting it can do back to the server. But I have spoken to folks where we, we saw it before with the density and the complexity of that code. Mm -hmm. If you try to alert on stuff happening in a web page, you're going to generate tens of thousands of alerts a week. And then it's just how realistic is that for a, for a security team to digest, especially if we're not talking about, you know, inbound firewall suspicious traffic. We're talking about a relatively new and relatively, um, uh, you know, uh, specific kind of attack vector. So we've tried to balance it uh, such that there shouldn't be any more alerts that are absolutely necessary. It seems like you've kind of struck the balance between security and usability in this sense and made it easy for people to put some guardrails around things that don't let malicious actors be successful, but also allow the components to function as they should. Correct? That's the goal. And yeah. I think that we have achieved it. I mean, credit where credit's due. I didn't develop the software. So uh, lots of other folks did a good job there. But yeah, it, that's the intent. And that's how it works. Because I mean, listen, we're a now a kind of medium uh, medium term startup. We've been around for you know, going on eight, nine years now. Um, and if you're coming into a new product category and solving a new problem, you can't realistically say to people, uh, it, you know, you've got to hire two FTEs to do this, or, yeah. you know, let's talk yeah. about deploying over the next six months. You got to kind of be easy to use and get in there and fix the problem. And I, you know, I want to be sort of modest, but I do think we've hit those notes. That's awesome. Uh, tell me a little bit about the founders and the, the journey of the company, Matt. I think it's interesting. Yeah. So uh, our we were founded in Israel. Um, our two co-founders, Hadar Blutrich and Avital Grishkovsky, they were their friends. I think they're still friends. They were a startup, <laughs> so I hope so. Um, but they had known each other for a long time. Hadar was working for a third-party JavaScript tool vendor, basically, and he was working with a bank. Um, and he was ner he got really nervous because as he was you know working with the tool on the site, he kind of just came to the realization, I could do whatever I want to this bank's website, and nobody knows that or seems to want to stop me from doing it, and that's kind of terrifying. Um, and so he said, "Hey, let's start a company." And now you know, eight years later, here I am talking to you guys. Um, and it's been you know a combination of his work and uh, an avatar's work and the combination of that kind of coming from vendor code land and uh, combining that with some security expertise that has led us where we are now. And, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, we got here a little early, <laughs> to be frank. You know, it's an emerging space. Gartner's now saying it's, it's, uh, it's probably going to be an essential part of everybody's security stack in the next three to five years. And it's been kind of my privilege over the last four years that I've been here to watch it mature into something that's um, that companies need and is helping people. So. Matt, what advice this, do, you, do you have, for, I'm sorry, Tyler, for um, security professionals that are listening to this going, wow, my company could really use something like this and I got to explain it to management. I got to explain it to like regular management, security management and developers and in, in the whole engineering team as well. Like, how, do you, how do you get people started on starting to um, evangelize this within their organizations? Sure. Yeah. I mean, so the tools I have uh, to offer, are, of course, source defense items, but, you know, we offer a threat report on our website. So mm -hmm. sourcedefense.com slash uh, check your exposure, I believe, check dash your dash exposure. Um, you can request basically a free analysis of your own website. It's, it's non-invasive. It just kind of visited our tools, visit your site with a with a web browser and then analyze they, what the JavaScript they see there and, and, and what it's doing. That's a great place to start. We've got some quick explainers up there too. Mm -hmm. um, in a more general sense, uh, let's see, OWASP is going to roll out their own. They were in the process of editing when I last spoke to them a couple of months ago, the top 10 for client-side security, which mm -hmm. will go over that kind of stuff. 
um, in a more in a more OWASPy um, formatted list sort of way. Um, and then there's been some good work amongst ISACs that I've spoken to across the country. Some of your audience may have seen it, but there's more grassroots efforts to get this stuff uh, into people's heads. But I do recommend you visit sourcedefense.com if you want to learn more from us or keep your eyes peeled for OWASP or just search for client-side security. You'll see, you'll see it all over the news. That's awesome. So you have a free checking tool on your website. I think that's a great place to start, right? Absolutely. Man, I just from had, a, oh, sorry, uh, Tyler had one oh, more question. Go ahead. I did Go have ahead. one more question. From, from an enterprise standpoint uh, and the ability to deploy this, say, widespread with things like Intune policies or uh, across multiple platforms with Jamf or, or Microsoft or Active Directory integrations and SCCM pushes, uh, is that pretty straightforward and is this uh, ready for mass deployment across uh, multiple enterprises? Yeah, that's a great question. So the answer is uh, that it's very easy from an enterprise sense because the web application is usually pretty centralized, right? Um, we're not talking about deploying to each individual endpoint. We're not even really talking about the inward facing sort of endpoint security kind of deal. We're talking about we need to add something to the, the customer facing or even the internally facing, but the, the content that the web application generates. So from that perspective, we we started the source that's dead simple. I would go into more technical detail about CDN delivery and everything else, but the point is add a couple lines of HTML. As far as more like enterprise um mature features and functionality yeah absolutely so you want the data i was describing to go into your sim you want uh, sso integration for the management of it you want customized rules for those different kinds of users whether it's a business user to verify that that analytics data like you guys were talking about before is showing up correctly or it's a security user to actually manage the the security access of that tool that's all possible so it's very easy for an enterprise to deploy because like i said web apps tend to be centralized and it's ready to go with uh, all the kind of bells and whistles and quality of life stuff you'd want to manage it uh, from an enterprise standpoint matt i just have five questions left for you are you ready to play five questions with security weekly i i'm not familiar with that and yes i absolutely am <laughs> matt three words to describe yourself um, oh, it's harder than I thought it would be. Uh, cybersecurity solution architect. How about that? If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Yeesh. Um, something, you know, practical. It's like nylon rope or something. Something you can have on hand. If you were in a book about yourself, what would the title be? Um, let's see. I regret, uh, uh, saying what my serial killer weapon would be on a live stream on the internet by Matt McGurk. <laughs> what is your favorite hacker movie? Oh, uh, it's hackers. That's, I don't even, well, okay. Uh, hackers. hackers or sneakers. Can I'm I have on, two? No, you gotta have, you gotta pick one. Cause I have this. Right, I'm picking sneakers. There's camp. There's camps. So, so now, now you're flipping to the dark side with sneakers. <laughs> I realized there were alignments to it. There, were, yeah, there sure, are. Be, yes. Um, there are alliances to, I will always be on the dark side with Robert Redford. That's, that's fine. I will give you that sneakers had like a better script and outstanding actors and actresses. Well, but um, I mean, let's not knock Johnny Lee Miller too hard. The guy's, the no. guy's done okay. So. Yeah. Right. But I have my reasons for why hackers is we can talk offline. Okay, uh, <laughs> Matt, choose two celebrities to be your parents. Two celebrities to be like, well, okay. So Robert Redford, I guess was the first one. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, uh, let's go with Tom Hiddleston. Fantastic. Matt, thank you so much for appearing on Paul Security Weekly. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, gentlemen, for having me. I appreciate it. It was fun. Hopefully it was useful. Make sure you check out Source Defense, securityweekly.com forward slash source defense. Coming up next, the security news. Stay tuned. Stay tuned.